I'm Michael Carey, the pastor of Church in the Wild. We've been reading through Paul's letter to the Galatians, Rediscovering the Gospel of Grace. And I'm in front of a Christmas tree because, of course, this message is the greatest gift we celebrate at Christmas. Now, today we're going to focus on this question that's been raised by the radical message of grace. If, in fact, it's not our deeds that save us, we're saved not because of good deeds that we do, we're saved not because we don't do evil, as if we could accomplish that, we are saved by trusting in God's free gift of grace, God's unconditional grace. And if that's all the case, which it is, then what's our motivation for doing good? Why shouldn't we just indulge ourselves if we are free from the bondage of religion? Well, let's begin with uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes in this last section, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and don't let yourselves be burdened again by yoke of slavery. Now, the yoke of slavery Paul refers to, of course, was them relying upon the Jewish religion to make them feel that they were righteous before God. Paul says, don't, don't slip back into that. Trust in the message of grace. He's also referring to irreligion, um, slavery to your appetites. Uh, the Gentile converts might have been tempted, hey, I'm going to receive the message of grace and I'm going to go back and, and live like I used to live, like a pagan. Paul's saying, no, there's a slavery not only to religion that you shouldn't embrace, there is, of course, a slavery to appetites, compulsions, addictions, and idols. Both religion and irreligion, while they are opposites, have ways of rejecting God's grace, and they are enslaving. So in verse 13, Paul addresses that question about why should we do good by saying, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, um, Paul, by saying don't indulge the sinful nature, he says our goal is to serve one another in love. He's actually reminding the church in Galatia that the law does have a positive value for us to show us God's intention. He was actually quoting Leviticus 19 verse 18, where it says the law is summed up in this principle, love your neighbor as yourself. In Romans 13, verse 18, Paul wrote, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, I've not come to do away with the law. I've come to help you understand the full, the full expectations of God's righteousness. So we are saved from the tyranny of living under the law, but we're also saved from becoming slaves to our appetites. Paul made this very clear in Ephesians 2, 8. We're saved by grace through faith for good works. And the heart of all this is love. While salvation is free, and it's because of God's unconditional love for us in choosing to adopt us as his children, we choose whether or not to receive that, we choose whether or not to to act upon the implications of that gift, to participate in God's transforming grace. So the next verse, verse 16, begins to make this more clear. Paul writes, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's the alternative. Rather than living under the law, rather than living under your self-centeredness, instead to live by the Spirit, living by the Spirit instead of indulging your sinful nature. The Father's gift of sending the Son is then followed by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that unique pathway, redeemed by the action of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
and then filled by the Holy Spirit of God, that is the true pathway to wholeness and to holiness. So I want you to listen as I read the contrast between what Paul calls the works of the flesh, and he's talking about um, in people that live under religion as well as live under their self-centeredness, and the contrast with what it means to walk in the Spirit. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So license, irreligion is not an option either, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating that under that umbrella of the works of the flesh, Paul listed a number of of irreligious sins like sexual immorality and drunkenness, and he mixed them with the kinds of sins religious people often do without even realizing that they're sinning, um, factions, dissensions, and envy. His point is that choosing to live without the grace of Jesus Christ yields self-centered people, whether they are irreligious self-centered people or religious self-centered people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the news that we are redeemed by God's sacrifice. Our sins are forgiven, and we get a whole new identity in Jesus. Remember in the musical Les Miserables that um, that incredible historical fiction set at the time, I guess right before the French Revolution, there was a main character named Jean Valjean, and this man had suffered many cruelties. And because of that, he had, his heart was hardened. He became a criminal. He was taken in by the hospitality of a very generous bishop. And the bishop not only gave him food, he gave him shelter. And Jean Valjean, wicked man that he had become, one night he stole the silverware from the bishop. And in the process, he struck the bishop um, in the process of the crime, a terrible thing. So the next scene in the movie is the, the soldiers have arrested Jean Valjean. They have found on his person the silverware that obviously belonged to the bishop. They brought him back in handcuffs. And as they, as they bring the captured criminal back to the bishop, the bishop comes and greets him. And the soldier announces, we found this man with your silverware. And the bishop says to Jean Valjean, um, why did you not take the candlesticks also? They all look shocked. And the soldiers say, wait a minute, you, you meant for him to take this silverware from your own? The bishop said, yes, yes. And, and, please, and he said to his servant, go get the candlesticks, get the candlesticks, give them to him. And so he gave him the, the, the very expensive candlesticks. And, and, the, and the soldiers were just beside themselves. They couldn't believe it. And he said, give the soldiers some wine. And then they were alone. The bishop um, pulled down his hood, looked him right in the eye, and said, at a costly price, I have redeemed your life and I give you back to God. It was an incredible demonstration of unconditional, unmerited grace for an unworthy person. And it also showed in the movie how that changed Jean Valjean. It broke his heart. It changed him. And that's, that's a compelling demonstration, of, a ex compelling example 
of, of what God does for us, the Father in sending the Son, Jesus, for us. Um, we're completely unworthy, but with costly love, he purchases our lives. And we can't be the same. We can't. We've been redeemed from death. We've been forgiven of our sins. And he gives us our lives. We are changed. We want to please him. Out of gratitude, we want to please him. And to top it off, the Father sends his Holy Spirit. That's Paul's message in Galatians 5. To top it off, the Father who already gave the Son, he gives the Holy Spirit and fills us with his life. The Spirit comes to remain with us even when we resist the Spirit, even if we quench the Spirit. The Spirit is holy. The Spirit will work within us. Um, it works within us to influence us, to become more like Christ. We make choices whether or not to walk in the guidance of the Spirit, but, we, but there is something at work in us greater than our self-help efforts. This um, spirit produces fruit. It's beautifully described in verse 22. It's, 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 he's conveying the way this is naturally at work, um, even when we're not consciously choosing it. The fruit of the spirit, as opposed to the works of the flesh, the works of the sinful nature, the fruit of the spirit is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And with great humor, Paul wrote in his letter, against such things there is no law. <laughs> yeah, who needs the law when the, when the personality of God is working powerfully to produce such fruit in your life? So, so this is what's going on for us and this is why this way of the gospel is far more powerful than religion living under law. And it's certainly more free than irreligion in being slave to our appetites. I'm going to read you two more verses starting with verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So by using the term crucified, we have crucified the sinful nature. He's referring to the long, torturous process of killing off the selfishness, the flaws in us, the brokenness in us, of, of, of allowing God and welcoming God's Holy Spirit work to slowly kill that off. The work is never completely done till resurrection. Nonetheless, the fruit of the Spirit emerges in beautiful, vivid ways. Isn't it interesting that Paul also came back to that image of walk in the Spirit? And he added one more word just to really drill it in. He said, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, the Greek word that was used originally was the word for troops marching as a centurion was calling the pace like a drill sergeant. And basically, Paul is saying, Listen to the Spirit, heed the Spirit, and march in step with the Spirit. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is asking God to show us the path we take, the steps we take that day. It is an incredible way for God to make much more beautiful people out of the ugliness of our lives. Now, I want to I wanna close with this, this one last thought. The Old Testament law does remain for us a treasure. We are no longer under it because we're in Christ, but the law gives us wonderful um, insight. Uh, the Ten Commandments are so helpful in understanding what it means to, to live good lives. Uh, there's so much insight about justice in the Old Testament. There um, are all kind of principles for holy living. Tim, Tim Keller um, clarifies that the law is something we aspire to live out in principle because of Christ in this uh, commentary on ver in verse, uh, excuse me, page 144. Keller writes, the gospel does free you to live any way you want. But if you truly understand through the gospel 
who Jesus is and what he has done, then you will ask, how can I live for him? And the answer will be, look at the will of God expressed in the law. The gospel frees us from the law for the law. It does away with our old, selfish, motivated, and unloving law obedience. And it motivates us to obey the law out of love. Now, Keller doesn't mean we obey the law literally like circumcision. He's talking about the timeless principles we find in the Jewish law. And I'll close with an example. Um, Just one of many examples. The Old Testament teaching on money. Now, Lynn and I don't tithe a certain percentage of our income to God's work in the world out of a fear that we must do that to earn God's favor. We believe we are saved by grace. We are free to make our choices about money. But we are motivated by the redemption we have in Christ. And he has filled our hearts with enough compassion that we want to live under our means and be disciplined to be able to be generous to help other people and to advance God's work in the world. And so we look to the Old Testament principle of tithing as a guide because setting aside a certain percentage helps us to be disciplined and to help us have plenty of margin in our lives to be generous with finances. And so we don't, um, we're not under tithing, but we choose to live into tithing and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Um, even making choices to um, sometimes in our lives go beyond that principle. This is what we mean when we say it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Amen.